Hey YouTube, it's Marita from the Nurse Lounge and today we are going to do yet again something different. We are um, going to actually do postpartum teaching. So I haven't done an actual teaching video in a while. The last one I think I did was the Bubble Her um, acronym for the postpartum assessment. This time we're going to do postpartum teaching and what we teach our patient or what we teach our students to teach our patients either way um, during the postpartum period. So if you want to see what I teach or what I teach my students to teach patients about the postpartum period and their care and recovery, stay tuned. <music> My name is Dr. Marita P. I'm a registered nurse. I've been a nurse for going on 16 years. OBGYN, well baby, is my specialty. And I am a nurse educator as well as a nurse mentor and nurse consultant. So we're going to jump right into this postpartum teaching. And again, these are the things that I teach my students who inadvertently teach patients or when I am on the bedside and do patient care because I do still work at the bedside. PRN, I teach this to my patients upon discharge or during their postpartum stay. All right, first of all, when I have my patient in postpartum, I basically um, teach them how to care for themselves after having a baby. That's what the postpartum period is. The postpartum period begins after the placenta has been delivered. And that usually begins while still in labor and delivery. So the patient is still labor delivery in which we, you know, they're in the recovery period, but that's when the postpartum period begins, meaning that the pregnancy is officially over. We want to teach our patients about how to keep themselves clean and what to expect during that period of time after having the baby. One of the first things we teach, and I do have notes, so you'll see me looking down from time to time. One of the first things we want to teach though is about the patient is the experience that she just had in terms of having a baby so we want them to kind of bond with the baby we talk about you know baby doing skin to skin this is more on the nursery side of it but this is where nursery and postpartum kind of overlap a little bit and so we want the mom to do skin to skin which basically means in that golden hour that first hour after having a baby if there's nothing wrong nothing going on with the baby as to why it needs immediate attention or resuscitation then they will put or place the baby on mom's chest for that bonding um, to begin and that skin to skin to occur so that baby can, for one, help regulate the baby's body temperature. It helps facilitate the bonding process, releases oxytocin, which is the, syn oxytocin is what the, it's not the synthetic, piptocin is synthetic oxytocin. So oxytocin is what the hormone that mom tends to make or create or increases once her baby, she's with her baby and she's bonding with her baby. So once that happens, then she will, you know, typically nurse for that first hour or so, bond, hold, talk, whatever they do with the baby for that first hour. They are encouraged to breastfeed, which I won't get into the nursery component per se, but I will kind of touch on things. Um, they're encouraged to breastfeed if that's what they're going to do, but typically that is that time where mom and baby is spending time together. After that, Within the first two hours after having her baby, we are wanting mom to get up to void. That's to go pee. If her legs are back, meaning that she, um, if she had an epidural, they're going to do what's called a leg test or something thereof to see if she can actually bear weight on her legs. And if she can't lift her leg up and it just, or it's just dead, it falls back down, that indicates to us that she is not ready to um, get out the bed. Once she is able to get out the bed, mind you, the epidural has already been pulled out her back. Um, she typically may or may not have the IV still in place. It just depends on the, the physician, the hospital, the nurse. Um, she may have the IV in place or may not. That just depends, but she's going to try to go to the restroom. Again, provided that her legs are stable and she is able to bear weight and walk on her legs. She's going to go to the restroom and attempt to void for the first time. 
Postpartum, we want them to void at least three measured voids. Um, and every hospital is different in terms of how many mLs each void. But for me personally, if she can avoid, if she can void at least 200 mLs um, for the first three voids, then I'm, I feel comfortable that she's able to void on her own and we no longer have to measure, measure her voids. However, that is contingent upon your hospital policy for that in the doctor's orders. Every hospital is not the same and physicians are not the same. So we want her to void. At that point in time, we introduce her to the water bottle, the peri bottle. <clears throat> I recommend putting warm water in the peri bottle because it is more soothing to the perineum. Once we fill it up with warm water, we will assist her or she will do it herself, either one, and basically squirting down there and rinsing off down there and kind of soothing that area. Once she does that, she may have stitches down in her vaginal area or her perineal area. And so that's gonna help soothe those stitches. In addition to that, it's going to help um, just, again, rinse off the blood and things like that. And then we're going to talk to her about wiping from front to back in terms of cleansing herself. Wipe from front to back so that you don't introduce any kind of bacteria into the urethra area. So after we do that, we're going to have her put her pads on. In the postpartum period, you cannot wear tampons. You're only wearing pads. And um, some places where adult diapers for postpartum and some postpartum patients will bring in something like Depends um, or those type of briefs where they just put them on and then they discard them every time they go to the restroom. So a lot of people will say, well, how often does she need to change her pad? She needs to change her pad every two to three hours. I used to tell patients to change their pad when they went to the restroom, but then I soon discovered that they were not going to the bathroom. So we want them to try to avoid every two to three hours as well as change your pad every two to three hours and do so around the clock. So that means she's going to get up all through the day, all through the night to change her pads and try to go avoid. I always encourage them to do so right before it's time to feed the baby. That way they'll know I need to get up, I need to change my pad, I need to um, clean, you know, rinse off, I need to avoid change everything, come out, wash my hands, and then feed my baby. And then by the time it's time to feed the baby again, it'll be kind of time for you to go back and do that same regimen all over again. And again, that's all through the day and night, especially for that first couple of days. I'm speaking directly about the um, vaginal deliveries when it comes to this. These sections have catheters in place, so this does not apply to them, but they will need to be kept clean every two to three hours, meaning that you're going to go and cleanse the perineal area all the way up the buttock, and turn them over so you can make sure that the, the back area is clean as well. Clean any chucks and make sure that the, the, the soil chucks are uh, taken away and put clean chucks underneath the patient for your C-section patients. <clears throat> but like I was saying, that is, that is in general what we would do for those patients. Then eventually after they do that, then they're ready to come over to the postpartum side if you're not in an LDRP. A LDRP is a labor, delivery, recover, postpartum room, which means the room that you start off in is the same room that you end up in when you go home. Um, we don't have an LDRP. We have a LDR and then postpartum is on another side. So they come over to postpartum at that point in time. Once they come over to postpartum, then the postpartum nurse assumes patient care. At our facility, we do not have couplet care, so the, no the postpartum nurse is just taking care of the mom and mom only. Once she comes to the postpartum side, that is where someone like me would take over. And at that point in time, I go and do an admission to the patient, meaning that we actually come and get them settled in, do our initial assessment, vital signs, and things like that. While I'm in there, I'm also teaching her about the orientation to the room, you know, where the TV is, how it works, how to call for food, how to call for your nurse, things like that. In addition to that, they typically want to know what the hospital stay is like at our facility. A vaginal delivery will stay for one to two days. A C-section will stay from two to four days, depending on what's going on with them. When it comes to the next thing they really want to know is about food. When it comes to your vaginal deliveries, as long as they're not nauseous, they can eat immediately. When it comes to your C-section, C-sections cannot eat immediately. They are a surgery patient. So they have to basically eat um, when they have bowel sound, when certain criteria is met, basically. Um, they start off on ice chips, then after that they go to clears, and then after that for our patients they typically go to a regular diet once they can pass gas, once they are not nauseous um, without medication, 
once they've been up moving, and once they have bowel sounds. Those, that's our four criteria for them to have a regular diet. And that again is bowel sounds, um, up moving, passing gas, no nausea or vomiting without medication. That's, what we, that's the criteria for me specifically for you to be able to get food. All right, so, and then after that, then you're, on, you're good to go for both, both sides. Now, next thing I usually want to encourage my patients to do is to bathe, okay? So there's nothing more refreshing than after you have a baby to go ahead and take a shower. So when it comes to bathing, I tell my moms specifically, um, the, post, the vaginal delivery moms, you're going to shower as you normally shower. You are going to wash the same way you normally wash. Now, the one thing that I do encourage them to do, if they are going to breastfeed their baby, I have them shower facing the water. That water, that warm water stimulates the breast to make milk when it's time. So therefore, we want them facing the water. For the moms who choose to bottle feed, I tell them to shower with the water hitting their back because we do not want to stimulate the breast to make more milk when we don't want the milk. So again, if you're going to breastfeed, shower facing the water. If you're going to bottle feed, shower um, away, the, wa the water hits you on your back. When it comes to soaps and things like that, we want something typically that's unscented. So we want something like Dove, typically. And some people use Dial, the antibacterial soap. But one thing I do discourage is to use anything like Bath and Body Works or Victoria's Secret or anything like that that's scented, especially in the vaginal area. This is an area that's highly sensitive. You may have um, lacerations or episiotomy down there. You've just had a baby and you're bleeding. So you need to, and it's ultra sensitive down there. So you do not or should not use fragrant type um, body washes, especially in that area. I have patients that if they feel the need to use those products, they can use them anywhere else on their body, but they cannot use it in the vaginal area. And if they are breastfeeding, they cannot use it on their breast because sometimes the babies do not want to, to nurse when you have Victoria's Secret on. They don't, they don't like that. You want a natural scent. You want the baby to be able to smell your pheromones um, that you emit. And that's what attracts the baby to you, not, not Victoria's Secret and, and not Bath and Body Works. So if you're going to use those products, then you're going to use them um, everywhere else with the exception of your breast and your uh, vaginal area. When it comes to um, the underwear, we talked about that. They have mesh panties that you can use to put the pad inside. Or again, people use those either adult diapers or those Depend type um, things to just pull up. And they dispose of them when they, um, every two to three hours when they change their pad. All right, so we talked about changing your pad every two to three hours as well as voiding every two to three hours. So what does the blood look like? The blood is called lochia. Lochia is very different than menstrual blood. So menstrual blood is what you, is the shedding of your endometrial lining. And once we get rid of that every month, then a new lining grows back to basically incubate or support the egg, uh, the fertilized egg, hopefully. And if we don't fertilize that egg, we don't get pregnant, it sheds again. The reason why we bleed after having a baby is because we have placental detachment. So when the placenta detaches from the uterine wall, it creates a wound, if you will. And just like any other wound on our hand or anything like that, it's going to create, it's going to bleed until that healing process occurs. So it bleeds and it bleeds and it bleeds and eventually forms a scab, if you will. And then it heals over by the end of your um, usually postpartum period, which can last, you know, for in terms of the bleeding up to six weeks. So when it comes to lochia, we call that lochia rubra in the hospital. Everybody in the hospital is called lochia rubra. That is that bright red to dark red blood. They have clots in it sometimes, sometimes not. Um, and it is pretty heavy typically. I tell patients it should mimic their periods, like the first few days of their periods, or maybe just a little bit heavier. For you all who are maybe teaching this material to someone, um, typically... If they are heavy bleeders with their period, they are they can be heavy bleed can be heavy bleeders with their um, postpartum bleeding. 
However, you wanna monitor that by doing your fundal assessment every four hours minimum and as needed if you see increased bleeding. After you have the lochia rubra, you have what's called serosa. And serosa is kind of like a um, pinkish reddish color in terms of the bleeding. That occurs after they leave the hospital, um, usually around uh, the second to third week is when they'll have lochia serosa. Again, it's like a pinky color. And then you have what's called lochia alba, which is a white kind of like discharge type color. And that's more towards the end of that, that period of time. And then after that, you will see nothing. And then she will start her menstrual period usually within a month or two, or it's contingent upon if she's breastfeeding or not and just how that works for her. So lochia, we tell the patients that their bleeding is normal. We check that bleeding every, um, every time we do an assessment and every four hours at the, for the first 24 hours. I always ask my patient, do you have any problems going to go pee? Do you have any problems with your bleeding? I'll say, how is your bleeding? And they'll say, oh, it's fine. Or I'll say, is it like your period? And they're like, yes, and, and we'll go from there. Um, if you have increased bleeding with your patient, so increased bleeding means you're saturating a pad within an hour, okay? So if she's filling up a pad within one hour, we have her take that pad off. We do vigorous fundal massage. So we're, we're actually supporting her on her mind's area, gloved, supporting her mind's area. You're taking your other hand and you're vigorously doing a fundal massage. And you're trying to see, now mind you would have taken her underwear or her whatever off. You're trying to see if um, she has any clots that's going to expel. Small little clots. When I say like pea sized clots, those can be relatively normal. The issue is when they become golf ball size clots or bigger, there could be plus retained placental fragments in her um, uterus that needs to be manually swept out. And typically the postpartum nurse, that is beyond her scope. So she typically cannot do it. Usually sometimes L&D nurses do it. And majority of the time um, physicians, the OB does it themselves. They'll have to come in, sterile glove, and basically manually scoop out those placental uh, fragments or clots that's in her uterus that keeps it from clamping down. I'm going to do another whole other video on complications um, in OB, so look out for that. But uh, just that's just an example. Um, let me write that down while I'm thinking about it. Complications in OB. All right, so after we talk about the bleeding, we talk about her going to the restroom, we talk about her shower showering. We also want to talk about those clots specifically in terms of she needs to be able to, or you need to tell your patient, if you are teaching this, that we need to be able to, to define or to describe those clots. Are they, you know, more circular, meaning that are they round? We need to describe them. Are they dime-shaped, dime-sized? Are they golf ball size? Are they tennis ball size? Or are they um, fist-sized clots? Be able to use those descriptors in your documentation because if you cannot, then that doesn't give anybody a visual of what that, that looks like. And also it helps your patient be able to describe if, you, if they flushed it and you didn't get to see it. What does those clots look like? Also, if they're, not, they're linear, not round, then you would say it was a um, one inch clot or a two inch you know, linear clot or something along those lines, but be able to describe the, the clot itself. After you talk to your patient about the clots and what to watch for, you also want to talk to your patient about medications. What medications are common during the postpartum period? So we typically give for the stitches down there or just for comfort, we give something like either a witch hazel tux, which is also good for hemorrhoids. We give um, a dermaplast spray, basically like a lidocaine spray to spray down there to help numb or soothe that area. We do the non-pharmacological method, which is the water bottle or sits baths. We also give PO medication. So for pain specifically, we can give Motrin, Tylenol, and of course your, your array of narcotics, such as Lortab or um, hydrocodone or oxycodone, Percocets, things like that. It's whatever the patient can have that she is not allergic to. So they get the same room of medications that even a heart patient would get in terms of the narcotics, okay? Our C-sections get morphine um, a lot of times if they're not allergic to morphine. 
Um, if they're allergic to these medications and they take them off their MAR and they don't get those medications, they get some type of substitute typically, or we do the best we can with Motrin or Motrin or Tylenol, depending on what their situation is. Um, Tordol is something else we tend to give our C-section patients for pain, which I love Tordol for our C-section patients. Giving them Tordol to me for my C-section patients really helps minimize how much morphine that they take. Um, so I love when they get uh, tore off. And they'll usually get about four doses for the first 24 hours and then they'll go right into um, PO Motrin later on. And for my patients, they typically take much, much, much less morphine um, than they would uh, without the tore off. So that's the pain medications. Um, other medications is your Colace, which is your stool softener. Um, we have nausea, you know, patients are nauseous, so we have Zofran that we give or... Um, what is it, Zofran or one other one, Finnergan, that we, we typically give. Um, we also give medications such as um, gas medications, Maalox, Milk of Mag, um, heartburn medications we have. We have Benadryl for itching, uh, reactions, things like that. Tylenol, of course. We give blood pressure medications. These are just the anomalies, so, so to speak, in terms of just things that are prescribed to them. But we give blood pressure medications, diabetic medications, um, thyroid medications, mental health medications, um, the, the substitute medications such as Suboxone or Methadone, we give that for people who are on a, a regimen to, to manage their uh, pain issues who are also have been or had taken some type of uh, narcotic that they no longer want to be on. So that's the regimen to, to wean off of that. So we give those medications as well. And then an array of other, a few other things as well. But those are the gist of the medications that we give. Most of our medications are giving on a PRN basis or as needed basis, meaning that they are not scheduled medications. The only medications that we actually give that are scheduled typically are our Colace that we give. We give uh, Motrin scheduled to our C-section patients. Um, we give any antibiotics that we need to give that's scheduled. We give, um, you know, the mental health medications, narcotic, narcotics are not scheduled, uh, but that's pretty much it. Everything else is as PRN as needed. We do give vaccines to our moms, so we give them flu vaccines when this flu season. If they are needing a, um, if they need their MMR, we give them that, and we also give them or offer them their Tdap vaccine, which is the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis vaccine. We offer that as well. Um, what else do we do for our moms? So we talk about birth control. And believe it or not, you will not believe how many people come back pregnant um, within that six week period of time because they have not practiced any birth control. Um, we talk about that very openly up to our patients. Um, we are not a, a faith based facility. So therefore, we definitely talk about religious, not religious. We talk about um, we talk about contraceptive practices and we actually talk about the fact that you can very easily get pregnant in that immediate postpartum period. And we recommend them get on something or abstain for at least the first six weeks. I am very, I'm very much a realist though. So I'll tell my patients up front, if you're not going to abstain, then make sure you use something like a condom or some type of barrier method until you are um, cleared to take some type of um, either long acting uh, contraception, such as, you know, uh, Depo or something like the Implanon or the, you know, NuvaRing or, IUD or something like that or you know if you choose to even get sterilized in terms of having a, a tubal ligation as an option that's an option as well typically for a tubal you can't just say hey I want a tubal today they will not do it it requires a 30-day waiting period typically where you've discussed this you've made up your mind you've signed the consent and you come back um, to have that procedure done so that's kind of how that works also some things we tell our patients to look look out for so we talk about the mood changes or hormone changes that she may endure. These are things like baby blues versus postpartum depression versus postpartum psychosis. I will not go heavily into each one, but I will say baby blues is very normal. It's just a hormonal shift. You will see patients who are sleep deprived. You will see patients who, um, they they they're they're overwhelmed with what's new about the baby their body is changing their whole family dynamic is changing and she's crying on about the commercial on tv 
I tell my patients that's very normal to cry about just something you like, I don't know why I'm crying. I have patients all the time. I don't know why I'm crying. And that's okay. What is not okay is when you are no longer able to care for yourself or the baby and you are having, I wouldn't say thoughts of harming yourself to that extent, but where you just, you're depressed. Um, you tend to shy away from baby. You, you turn the lights out. You're not showering. You're not, you know, thinking about future plans. You're not doing any of these things because you are, um, this chemical imbalance that you have due to, you know, the hormones. And we want you to seek help in that situation. You want to call your provider at that point in time, usually your OB to say that, Hey, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing so well. And we tell them this upon discharge. And in addition to that, at our facility, we do what's called the um, Edinburgh scale, EPDS or EDPS, one of them. And we, we do that um, on admission to postpartum just to see where baseline where they are depression wise. And if we do get a score of 10 or above, or they do say blatantly that I have thought about harming myself in the past seven days, then we automatically put in a referral to the caseworker to see about getting her some help. Typically this scale or screening is done again at some point in the future, either at the pediatrician's office or at the OB office um, at one of her checkups. But we wanna kinda of keep an eye on postpartum depression because it is real. Postpartum psychosis is, goes a, a bit further than that. A lot of times these people have to be institutionalized and they are at risk if they did not for harming their baby. They see things, they, they think the baby is the devil or they, they, they have visions of harming the baby, suffocating the baby. Typically those babies have to be removed from mom until she can get treatment and get better and, and get through this process. Um, I do recommend a movie called First Born and um, firstborn, I think her name is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Shue, is the, um, is the actress in the movie. And I think it came out in 2006. It is a psychological thriller movie. However, it creates or shows a great depiction of what postpartum psychosis looks like. And I actually use that video in my classes to show a, visualiz a visualization of what postpartum psychosis looks like. Um, of course, it's a movie, but nonetheless, um, it's just a great depiction of what it looks like because you will rarely see postpartum psychosis in a hospital, if ever, because it comes on so much, so later, so much later in the recovery period. Now, I will say if mom already has an underlying um, depression issue, then you will see postpartum depression probably sneak up a little bit sooner than later when it comes to um, how it usually works. Usually it's the blues for a few, you know, a week or so, and then it goes into depression, then it can go into psychosis a little later. But if she already has an underlying chronic depression, then, or, or bipolar, where she has depressive moods and then she has the manic side, then you can see this come sooner. So be on the lookout for that. So mental health is very, very important when it comes to our patients and their families. In addition to the mental health component, we want to talk about nutrition, food and nutrition. Food and nutrition is very important to make sure that she's eating very, very well or as best as she can be because most of our moms are breastfeeding moms. So we want a well-balanced diet, high in fiber, high in fresh fruits, uh, vegetables, protein, which is where your meats come from, dairy if she can tolerate it, um, beans, nuts, things like things that we should be eating anyway she needs to be eating that and then an additional 300 calories more if she is um, breastfeeding. Um, the 300 calories sounds like it's a lot, but it's not. It's like an additional apple and a half or two per day. It's not a lot at all. So we want to encourage her to eat as little junk as possible, but really good, well-balanced, um, nutrient-filled foods. Make sure her calories count, basically is what we're saying here. Drink plenty of water. It helps flush the system, plus keeps her hydrated, plus helps her with her breast milk. Breast milk, I'm not gonna go into to, to nursery too much, but breast milk typically comes in in about three days postpartum. However, we want her to still continue to put the baby to breast every two to three hours around the clock until the breast milk fully comes in. Colostrum is what's that pre-milk. It is nutrient rich for the baby. And we encourage her to give the baby that, um, that colostrum prior to that breast milk actually fully coming in. If she's not going to breastfeed, we want them to wear, or actually both parents, both 
breastfeed or not, we want them to wear a supportive bra. So when that milk does come in, it gets pretty hit. Her breast gets pretty heavy. You want her to wear a supportive bra 24 seven for the first couple of weeks. When it comes to um, clothing, if she had a C-section, you want her to have less restrictive clothing around the abdomen area because of the fact that of course, she just had an incision there. And we need to let that incision breathe. I'm going to do a C-section more detailed after I finish this part, but I want to kind of get through the, the gist of postpartum in general, and then the specifics of vaginal delivery, and then I'll get into the specifics of a C-section because they are very, very different when it comes to their care. Um, something else we want to talk about is headaches. A lot of our moms tend to have headaches, and sometimes we just give them some caffeine, like a Coke or something like that, or give them medications to help help with those headaches. Um, it, that is just pretty typical. You wanna be mindful though of the patient's blood pressure and vital signs when it comes to where are these headaches coming from to make sure their blood pressure is not going up, they don't have hypertension, versus them being dehydrated. Those are two different things, and you want to be able to address and um, treat accordingly. Vital signs. Vital signs vary for our patients. We have sometimes relatively healthy patients. So our vital signs can be on the lower end. I've had patients whose blood pressures have been in the 80s over 40s and for them that is their trend and it's okay. I've had patients obviously in the 150s over whatever 90s and for them not that it's okay but that's where they trend and they are usually considered hypertensive and we, we have to treat them accordingly. So with that being said we want to make sure that they are being cared for in the appropriate manner because of the fact that we don't know if this is truly blood pressure related or it's something more like dehydration. So that's with headaches. Something else we want to talk to our patients about is um, blood clots, okay? Um, in nursing school, they are trying to move away from doing what's called the home and sign where you dorsiflex the foot and you ask them if they have any calf pain. At our facility, we still do home and sign. And so with that being said, since we still do home and sign, um, the importance of the home and sign is knowing that this is not a diagnostic screen. This is not a diagnostic, uh, it's a screening um, tool. So it doesn't diagnose DVT or deep vein thrombosis. It is a screening tool to rule out that and other things. So we still do it, our, our, do it at our facility. What you are checking for though, and what you're teaching your patient to check for, is the warmth behind their uh, calves, if they have nodules behind their calves, if one calf seems larger than the other, if there's obviously pain in the calves, then we may want to check and further investigate for signs and symptoms of DVT, uh, further signs and symptoms of DVT. If they do have those signs and symptoms of a DVT, we want to contact the physician and basically, you know, find out exactly what we need to do as the nurse uh, or if they're at, the home, at home, they need to see about getting back to the hospital setting um, pretty immediately. All right, so that is a gist of what the postpartum teaching entails when it comes to the mom. Um, if I've missed something, feel free to comment that below. Now we're gonna move into the C-section side, okay? I kind of alluded a little bit on the C-section side about how when they, they first come over from labor and delivery, they come over in a bed and they come over uh, with SCDs on, IV, things like that, everything hooked up. When it comes to the postpartum side, we then talk to them about um, teaching them about the incentives parameter. So that's that thing that you basically suck in and you hold and get to a certain level. It helps with their lungs. We want to make sure that since they're immobile for a period of time, now at our facility, they are immobile for the first 20, for the first 12 hours. Well, they, they're not get out of bed for the first 12 hours, eight to 12 hours or so. I personally do get my patients up typically between the uh, eight and 12 hour mark. I try to get my patients up and get them moving again if possible. It depends on if they're nauseous or things like that. Um, but again, they can't eat because they have to have a certain, they have to have those four criteria we talked about. So they won't eat until after that. Once I get my patient up for the first time, she is on her own after that to get up. Um, and that's at our facility. We get our patients up for the first time and then they're on their own to get up and um, move about accordingly. So they will 
I teach them how to pull, unplug their IV, how to hang their catheter bag on the pump, and then go from there. Um, their, I, their catheters come out typically around uh, 24 hours or so. We, we keep up with their eyes and nose every four hours. And um, we keep up with their IV fluids and things like that. So then we pull their catheter. At our facility, they have six hours to avoid from the time that catheter is pulled. So from the time the catheter is pulled, they have six hours. So if we pull it at six o'clock in the morning, they have noon till noon to void. Once they void, they then have the three measured voids that they have to do to make sure that they are able, their, their bladder is emptying properly and that they can empty their bladder like we were just saying. Um, if my patient voids a thousand the first time, for me, I'm good with that. So if you can void a thousand plus the first time, I'm not worried about the rest of the voids in terms of measured voids. After that, um, they have to use the hat as long as they have an IV in place. So they pee in that hat until the IV in place. But if the IV is gone, which we take out at 24 hours, then you know they can um, throw away the hat. When it comes to their dressing, at our facility, we as our nurses, we take off their dressing. At your facility, you may the physician may take off the, the dressing themselves. It just depends on you know the doctor's orders, the policies at your facility. But at ours, we take off the dressing ourselves. And we talk about how to clean that incision. And for my patients, I basically tell them that they're going to, you know, wash their body as normal. The same things apply regarding facing the shower or, or away from the shower if you're going to breast or bottle feed. But the incision itself, I said, get your rag with soap, get it all soapy with the soaps we talked about earlier. And basically, you know, kind of squeeze that soapy rag over the incision. And then you're going to wring it out and then that clean water, you're going to rinse off with that. And that's probably going to be the last thing that you do. I do tell them, do not use the same washcloth. And I do, believe it or not, I have to tell people this. Do not use the same washcloth in the vaginal area as you do your incision area or your face. So I typically give my patient at least two to three washcloths. And I simply say, wash, use this one for your face, use this one for this, and use this one for that. You know, And they, they pretty much understand that. If they happen to do use the same washcloth, I will say to wash the vaginal area and the buttock area last. Everything else needs to be washed first if you're going to use the same washcloth. But otherwise, I try to give them two or three washcloths so they don't have to worry about that. But definitely emphasize that. Do, you, do not be surprised about what or do not assume that your patients know. Your patients may not know. Everyone does not come from the same walk of life. So, so be mindful of that. We want our C-section patients to walk in the hallway. I have a hard time getting my patients to walk in the hallway. Well, I don't, but a lot of nurses get a, have a hard time getting patients to walk in the hallway. We want, they'll say, well, we're walking around the room. No, 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 you want them to walk distance, not just walking, okay? Distance is what helps build your endurance up because I can guarantee you most people live in a house that is bigger than their room, the, their patient room. And eventually baby will be in one room and mama and daddy will be in another room in terms of doing, doing daily things or whatever. She needs to be able to get around her room, her house. So therefore we want them to walk, walk, walk. Um, a lot of times we have patients who they have that gas buildup. So keep in mind as you tend to, um, the gas build, builds up. So she, she's been opened up from having the procedure done. The gas builds up. And when they close you back up, they seal that in there, so to speak. And so also your, your, your um, intestines are trying to begin to work again. So that air is trying to push through, push through, push through. And they have what's called referred pain because you will hear them say, oh, I have pain up here or they'll have it in their back area up here. That's called referred pain and that's gas pain. We tell them, Lord tabs don't fix that. You need gas medicine for that and you need to walk. So I have my patients walk, 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 walk. Um, a lot of times I'll have them take a shower, go walk, and then come back and take pain medication. I do not give narcotics for them to get up out the bed and move. And one big deal, I do not give narcotics to go take a shower. So they'll say, hey, I want to get take some medicine to go take my shower. Nope, take your shower first and then go take your narcotics and go to bed type of thing or sit down and rest. What happens is if you take narcotics and go take a shower, well, of course the shower gets to feeling really, really good because you hadn't had a shower in a while. And because that warm water dilates those vessels and or the veins, they dilate them, the vessels, 
And as a result, the medication tends to take effect much sooner, much quicker. And the next thing you know, they have fallen out and fainted in the shower. You have a problem, you have an incident report, and you got more work to do. No, no, no. No one gets medication before they take a shower from me. If you have to have the medication now, you take the medication now, wait a couple of hours, then you can take your shower. Or take your shower, as soon as you come out from your shower, I'm ready to give you a pain medication, narcotic pain medication that is, and then you can rest. More Motrin and Tylenol, I will give them that to go take a shower, but I will not give narcotics to take a shower. Or morphine, which is a narcotic, so... Be mindful of those types of things. Be mindful of side effects of medication and teach your patients the side effects of these medications. Yes, this will cause you to be sleepy. Yes, this will cause you to do this. Yes, this will cause you to do that. Yes, you know, just tell them the side effects so they can tell you when they are having issues with these medications. Also, with our C-sections, they are um, surgery patients. So with surgery patients, you want to be mindful, even more diligent about those blood clots because they had a surgery. They had a major abdominal surgery that just happened to be the way the baby came, that the baby came out. So be mindful of blood clots and things like that in their legs. Um, that's more important for you to do those things with them. Pain, their pain threshold is going to be a little bit you know, higher, going to be more pain typically because they had um, surgery, major surgery. Um, again, they go home in two to four days, depending on what's going on. Um, they take the same medications that your C-sections take. The only difference is they start off taking morphine at our facility or Toradol, like we discussed. And then after that, they go to PO narcotics after 24 hours of um, the morphine or the IV narcotics. They go to, um, they go to uh, PO narcotics and they have their Motrin around the clock and they have Tylenol available for some physicians. Um, there is pretty much nothing else that's any different about the C-section than the vaginal delivery going after that point. After they both get moving and going, it's pretty much the same. It just takes longer because, again, they had a C-section. So be mindful of that. That's pretty typical. The same um, postpartum in terms of moods can occur. Um, for both groups, you're going to watch for the fact that they are sleep-deprived. So when they're sleep-deprived, trying to learn how to feed baby and things like that, they can be irritable. Patients can be irritable. They don't be bothered. They're, they always say, I'm tired, which, you know, to be expected. Um, you want to check for a support system. Who's coming to visit them in the hospital? Now, unfortunately, I'm making this video during the whole COVID situation and, and quarantine and hospitals have, you know, kind of um, not allowing a lot of visitors to come in to be supportive of mom. Um, but in a, in a normal situation, you're going to have where you know, she has a support system. So you want to watch for that support system. Who is she? Who is coming to see her? Who's going to help her take care of the baby? Who's going to teach her at home? And in the event we find that she doesn't really have anybody, or we find that she is mentally um, inept, we find that something's just off, then we have to contact case management to um, kind of intervene and see what resources we can provide for her and the family after the fact. Now, one group of people that I'm not really going to get into because I've already did this in other videos, the teaching that comes with when you have mom who moms who are on um, some type of narcotic or drug type of thing and withdrawal type of thing, mom withdrawing and or baby withdrawing, depending on the situation. So baby withdrawing is another whole video because that's the nursery side of it. But when it comes to mom withdrawing, um, we have to be mindful of what she was on and, and what, you know, and I don't mean like she's on Suboxone. I mean, she came in on cocaine or she came in on, um, heroin or she came in on even marijuana. And now because she's not getting it, it's not in her system. She's beginning to withdraw from that. So we have to be mindful of what to watch for, for that. I'm in mean, the postpartum period. And then I've had to call the last two times a rapid response because of the fact that the patient was OB fine, but because of the withdrawal, she needed to go to ICU because we don't handle those kind of patients on our floor. So um, again, you have to be mindful of those situations. And I want to say that pretty much sums up postpartum teaching. I can't really think of anything else that we really kind of go into for the mom side. Again, nursery is another whole video. Um, but if you happen to have thought of something or have a question about something, comment that below. I, you know, do this every day in my, in my work world. So, um, things for me just kind of come off the top of my head. I happen to know we talked about no abstinence, no sexual intercourse. We talked about 
Oh, we talked about abstinence, but nothing goes in the vagina for the next six weeks. So no tampons, no dushing, and no intercourse. Nothing in there. And then we encourage them to definitely, um, before they go home or right when they get home, go ahead and make their appointment for their next checkup. I tell moms to do that while they're still at the hospital only because of the fact that they're still there and it's fresh on their mind. By the time they get home and get acclimated to home and realize, oh, I need to make my appointment, it's been four or five weeks and they can't get in for their six-week checkup. So I always encourage them to do that before they leave the hospital to go ahead and make that appointment for the six-week checkup. And of course, prescriptions. Um, prescriptions are done differently every place. Most of our prescriptions are actually called into the pharmacy from the hospital. If not, they get a paper script and they have to take it to the pharmacy and get it filled. And then we, I tell them to not take narcotics and drive. I tell them that if you want to take the narcotics, that they need to, you know, take it at, usually at night um, or when they really need it. I tell people that they will not be pain free. Having a baby is not a pain free experience by no means. There's nothing about it that's pain free. Um, the medication is meant to bring down your pain to a certain level so that you can function and take care of yourself and your baby, but it's not meant for you to be pain free. And so that's something we have to talk to our patients about, especially here in Tennessee, being that it is the third um, highest state in terms of opioid abuse. We will not be pain free. And that's not our expectation to get you pain free. It's just to manage your pain. And when it comes to car seats, our facility doesn't really teach you have to come in knowing how to do your car seat we don't we don't do the car seat um the only thing i check for is to make sure that, that there's only two fingers that can get underneath between the baby and the actual straps themselves outside of that you need to help know how to operate your car your car seat in terms of putting it in your car we do provide literature about where the, the fire station is that actually put in or install car seats for you but as nurses we do not put in car seats because we will not be held liable if something happens and you get in a car accident on the way and something happens to the baby so i want to be mindful of you i advise you not to put in car seats for your patients in the actual car um they need to know how to do that you know we kind of guide or talk them through but we don't put anything through in the car because then it's our fault that they get in a car accident and one more thing i do not give narcotics upon discharge that is a nursing judgment thing that's just me you all govern yourselves accordingly but I do not give narcotics upon discharge because if she decides for whatever reason that she's going to get into the driver's side of the car. So maybe you took them down, you walked them down and she was in the back seat with the baby. But then down the road, she gets in a car accident and because now she's driving for some reason, she's changed. You are liable if something happens to her because of the fact that you just gave her narcotics right before she left. I will not do that. I will not do that. I will say you can take the narcotics and stay for a couple more hours or you don't get narcotics and you can take your motion and leave and go, and go home. So, and then on top of that, if you do give narcotics up on discharge, if you did, and she goes to the pharmacy and picks up her medication, she can easily take another dose and you couldn't do anything about it. So, and then she get overdose on those narcotics. So I personally will not do it. There's a nursing judgment that is not a policy. Um, I have been reprimanded for it and I still, I'm still employed. So, you know, I'm not going to do it. You can fire me if you want to, but I still have a license is the point. Um, I want to say this is, this wraps up my postpartum teaching in general. This is for those who, if you're watching this video, this is for you. If you're wanting to come over into postpartum, this is for you. If you're in nursing school, um, and you're about to go to your OB rotation, this is for you. If you are even a patient. This is what we teach our patients um, about how to care for themselves after having a baby and what you should be doing and things to think about and consider um, postpartum wise. So this is what I do in a, in a nutshell. I hope this has been beneficial to you. Um, I will do a postpartum complications video for those in school who want to know, you know, how we handle postpartum complications. But if you want to um, have questions, concerns, you can comment them below in the comment box. I will have my IG uh, either here, here, or it's also in the banner, and it will also be in the in the box below if you want to follow me on IG. I actually encourage you to follow me on IG. Um, I'm not only just a nurse educator, but I do have a life outside of nursing, and you will see some of that over there. Um, in addition to that, my business email will be below. Um, if you are a nursing student and you're looking for tutoring, help, mentor, coaching, I have a business in which I will be doing that. Feel free to contact me via email, not here, via email, and we can discuss the, the logistics of that. I will be doing those meetings via Zoom as we are doing currently. 
and um, I would love to be of assistance to you if you happen to need that kind of assistance for nursing school. So until the next time, thank you all so much for watching this video to the end. You all take care. Bye-bye.